Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Christian Dawson, and I'm executive director of the MHZ Foundation. And the MHZ Foundation is the home of a project called Curationist. Uh, and Curationist uh, focuses on trying to create a technological environment where we can take the world's great arts and culture uh, that are available via open access and make them uh, available to to curate and to present to the world in an uh, open and accessible manner. Uh, so if you think of it, uh, the way that Wikipedia shares the world's knowledge, uh, uh, we are looking to share the world's uh, arts and culture and do cultural storytelling about those types of environments. When I think about what the main benefits of open culture are, I feel like open culture contributes to democratic values and civic part participation by giving people everything they need to participate in a culture-wide conversation about history, culture, and, and the future. Um, there are so, there's so much uh, information that's coming at us on a daily basis. It's very hard to process. Uh, but when we engage with uh, well-curated cultural works in a museum-type environment, we are moved. We are moved to change our hearts. And I feel like uh, the environment that we try to create with Curationist to be able to share those experiences digitally with the world, uh, leveraging the cultural works of the world, gives people the opportunity to have their hearts and minds change, which in this in this sometimes very um, uh, myopic and sort of bubble focused world where people get into their own uh, uh, cycles of uh, understanding, it's important for us to be able to break through those cycles with uh, with uh, things that challenge us to greater cultural understanding. Um, open culture also creates a level playing field for economic and educational advancement by making knowledge accessible to everyone, regardless of income and geography. That was the amazing thing about the Wikipedia experiment was that we took the world's knowledge and, and, and created an environment where we could share that uh, with, with everybody, regardless of income. Uh, the the whole concept behind our project was what if we could do that with uh with the world's uh um uh, uh, uh cultural artifacts culture i mean the first one's awareness many people are still not aware that open culture is a possibility or that models of cultural heritage exist outside of traditional institutions also access the digital divide and other technological access issues prevent smaller and or more rural organizations from digitizing their collections or contributing to existing platforms. There's also a very real uh, issue of incentives. Um, the privatized knowledge and culture model is widely incentivized for people to participate by offering prestige and, and funding to contributions, to contributors. Uh, meanwhile, open culture is talked about as sort of a purely philanthropic effort one that's, you know, for the greater good, uh, but doesn't offer similar incentives for participation. So the question is often, how do we show people the tangible benefits of open culture in addition to the greater good? When I think about something that somebody told me that opened my eyes uh, and, and open my mind about open culture, it has to do with those incentives. Uh, so I had a conversation when we were very early in developing this project, Curationist, with Ryan Merkley, who at the time was uh, the executive director of the Creative Commons. And he told me about a project they've been working on for about five years with the Met to digitize their collection and share it in either CC0 or CC BY. Um, and there were a lot of people on the board of the Met who were very concerned, thinking, hey, if this stuff exists online and is freely available, why would anybody come through our doors ever again? Um, but the way that he explained it to me, as soon as they did their release, uh, 
uh, the Met went from, I think, the third cultural institution in in uh, in uh, traffic and attendance in the New York City area to number one overnight. People saw that what was what was there, what was available to go see, and people were flocking to do it. Um, so there was a bit of cultural tourism there. Now that is for a major institution with a lot of resources. It's a very different set of circumstances when you're talking about smaller um, small organizations with smaller budgets and different remits than the ones that exist within the Met environment. So I'm certainly not saying that every uh, glam institution, every cultural institution has the same set of criteria that the Met does. But, you know, one of the things that we were thinking about as we were starting to develop the technological tools behind Curationist was how could we put the power of that experience of being able to do that cultural sharing that the Met has done, that the Smithsonian has done, that the Rijksmuseum do has done, that the major institutions have done. How do we try to put that same set of tools and opportunities in front of smaller institutions? Um, when I think about a message to those hesitating to open up their collections, uh, I do have to acknowledge that every institution is different and everyone has a different uh, mandate, uh, a different mission. There are many that would greatly benefit from opening up their collections from, if, if you would, in this circumstance, sort of heading down the map path of sharing and seeing that um, basically increase their visibility and therefore being able to better articulate their mission. Not every institution is going to be like that. There are institutions that deal with living artists that really can't do open sharing in a way uh, that uh, that uh, ones who deal with antiquities could for uh, for reasons of uh, copyright that are very understandable. Uh, there are some institutions who have some very uh, reasonable conversations that are ongoing regarding the um, uh, the agency that they feel when it comes to cultural sharing, when it comes to their own heritage. The Maori people have been talking about that uh, and, and have been leaders in having those conversations. And I don't think there's any one right answer. Um, there's not a single path for all GLAM institutions. However, um, if you go uh, onto um, the Wikipedia environment, they've identified that there are, I think, somewhere around 85,000 known uh, cultural heritage institutions in the world, approximately. And I've seen a list that around 1,400 or so have digitized their collections in some format. Um, that's a huge difference in numbers, 1,400 out of 85,000. There are certainly lots of institutions who have a great deal of uh, opportunity in, in moving from that category and increasing that number of 1400 institutions who have done some form of digitization uh, to take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, I'm proud that our organization has uh, started to develop technological tools to aid people uh, who are uh, in and uh, who collaborate with GLAM institutions to help aid them in the process of heading down, uh, down that path of uh, um, digitization and sharing. Um, my hope is that we help foster uh, more than simply the 1,400 that have done digitization to to uh, to cross over the boundary. I don't think that it is appropriate for all 85,000, if indeed that is the number, uh, to to do digitization and sharing. But you know, uh, certainly a extremely large portion of them would probably benefit, and the world would benefit from having the increased cultural perspective that comes with having access to um, the knowledge and cultural perspectives uh, that your institutions share from a digital perspective.